الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ما بعد we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way he deserves to be praised. And we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send his salutations and his blessings upon his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his companions, upon his wives, and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of recompense. As to what follows, the unshakable foundation. Why is this relevant? Why is this relevant today? more so than it was relevant yesterday let alone a month ago a year ago or even a few years ago i am sure those of you who reside in this country which means all of you right now and who travel outside abroad often can identify a lot of changes a lot of differences a lot of confusion um, a lot of which are of negative nature. Um, the widespread of atheism and the call to the abandonment of the belief in the divine entity and uh, mockery of religion and religious people. And the list goes on. It's way too many to enumerate. Um, it makes you wonder, you know, what does it take for someone to remain firm? in these very, you know, confusing stages of a human's life. And as in everything else, as opposed to what many claim, as in everything else, the Prophet ﷺ, through the revelation he received from Allah, the Qur'an, and through his words and advice and direction, did not leave the subject matter unattended. Did not. He never did, alayhi salatu He didn't even, he didn't even uh, neglect areas of personal hygiene, which really is logical. You don't need to tell someone that you need to smell good and you can't smell bad. It, it doesn't, you don't need someone to tell you that. It's something that humans are naturally created with that, you know, you, you, you turn away, you're, you're feel, you're deterred from, from anything that is foul in nature. Food that doesn't taste good, uh, smell that is not good. It's something that is repulsive and vice versa. So that's built in. In spite of that, we have very detailed instructions from the Prophet ﷺ as to how to take care of oneself. To the minute details. And so someone wonders when it comes to what will keep us among the survivors, I would say the survivors in this day and time, what do we need to do? And what do we need to have? What kind of asset is a fundamental requirement? And what are the things which we can do without? I am sure, or I hope, that most of you have the answer to this particular question. And that even if I didn't tell you what it is, if I just left you hanging as they say right now, all of you have already figured out what is it that we need to have in relevant or in the context of the title, right? If you think about the title, what would be that unshakable foundation that will help us survive? Young man in the back, Mr. Volunteer. He's like, what did I do to get this? <laughs> it's okay, you can give me a wrong answer. There's no wrong answer actually. But you cannot give me the right answer and I'll be fine. What do you think we need to have? to survive in this day and time with all the changes that we see self-control self okay that's a modern relevant answer it's related but from a from, from a religious point of view specifically uh, akhlaq the holy quran and sunnah the holy quran and sunnah we'll discuss the term holy in a little bit uh, we'll overlook that for now. The Holy Quran and Sunnah, okay, the Quran and the Sunnah, surely. But the, the Quran and the Sunnah basically are like a, a guideline for your entire life. What area 
Is it, for example, ibadat? This is the time for you to be worshipping Allah more profusely, uh, more sunan, more nawafil. That could be one answer. Another answer could be um, Muslims start being less, you know, involved in cheating each other in business transactions, having honesty and so on and so forth. So in mu'amalat, in the transactions, we, you know, we abandon riba and so on and so forth. That could be another answer. Someone would say it's about morals, manners, mannerism. We're lacking mannerism. If we had better manners, then your manners will help you, uh, you know, outlive the storm that has taken everybody. And then so on and so forth. Someone could say it's, it's other things. What do you think would be the most important of the things I mentioned or the things that I deliberately didn't mention? Tawheed, okay. For Saturday morning, that's a good answer. <laughs> I know many of you would be sleeping right now, that's why. Um, tawheed, and Tawheed is what? Is what part of our... What is the title? It's a foundation. And w which is under what? Aqeedah. Aqeedah. Believe it or not. And it's something that can never be overemphasized. No one can come and say, Yeah, Sheikh, not me being the Sheikh. Well, you know how people in Jeddah speak, everybody's a Sheikh. They see a cat walking down and say, Yeah, Sheikh, move out of the way. So in, in Jeddah or in Saudi, everybody's a Sheikh. So I'm not saying that, giving myself the title Sheikh. But someone say, Yeah, again, and could we not discuss something else? Sure, we could discuss many things. Barakallah um, Is this recording? Type. I have an advice for you. Because if it receives a phone call, even if it's on silent, it will cause these uh, anyway, vibrations. I'm recording this. I will upload it on my website. And I'll give you the MP3, inshallah. Ma'alish, huh? Zakallah khair. I've learned this lesson in the past. Let alone if the phone actually rang. That's a whole other story. al muhim. It is aqidah. And let's just take it to the very basic level. When a person... When a person is a Christian or a Jew or a Hindu or a Buddhist or an atheist or whatever he may be and we want to introduce Islam to this person or he decides to become Muslim what do you tell him? The first thing to do is go pray go make wudu fast with us when Ramadan comes around if he were to do all of the acts of worship that you're doing on daily basis he copy pastes everything you do but at no point did he declare he, didn't, he never understood the shahada, never declared the shahada, never knew what it entails, then we all agree that it will be of no value. It's a complete waste of his effort. Allah says, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْ ثُورًا We came to all of those deeds which the disbelievers would have done, and we made it like scattered dust. It will be like scattered dust. وَلَئِنْ أَشْرَكْتُمْ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكُمْ and if you were to ever commit shirk, then all of your deeds will be nullified. Subhanallah, the deeds will be nullified. They will be of no value. So fundamentally for a person to start his journey as a Muslim, you have to begin by not just them declaring the declaration of faith, understanding it. And I remember one time way back in the day, <laughs> uh, they were like the new Muslims, we used to take them to the mahkama for them to make their de declaration of faith in front of the Qadi and then they would receive their certificate that they're officially Muslims through the Da'wah Center. And I guess maybe some of these who joined didn't get to attend the classes regularly, you know. The, the Da'wah Center does its job, but sometimes the actual participant, the, the, the new Muslim, doesn't come to the classes. He may, he may have missed a few classes which I would believe are core in his understanding. And then on the way there, I, I used to play games with them. I'd ask them questions just because they're nervous. They're, in their mind, we're going to a court. There's a qadi. Maybe, maybe some of them think they're going to be arrested and sent back home, you know. Maybe it's a plot against them. Whatever the reasons may be, they used to freak out. And so I try to, you know, mellow down the, the mood and make them feel good and so on and so forth. I ask them some questions. And I, one of these times I said, okay, and so wh who is Jesus? And so one of them said, the son of God. I was like, oh my God, we're taking this guy right now to declare the shahada become Muslim. He still believes Jesus is the son of God. So like, where, what happened? You know, um, he became Muslim and he's probably learning the Fatiha and he's praying already. And the young man, 
and I'm assuming it's not his fault, or maybe it is his fault because he missed the class, whatever. He did not know. He still did not know who Jesus was in Islam. And so that's why we don't want to haste. A lot of people are hasting to bring in people to, people to Islam by just making them repeat the shahada and they, eh, they make a little celebration. MashaAllah, 50 people became Muslim today. La ya Shaykh. And these 50 people tomorrow, they're 49 who are left Islam and only one will remain Muslim if they never understood what they're getting into. So it's about understanding. Aqeedah is more important than your manners. You could be the nicest person in the world. Nicest person in the world. According to the global standards, Mother Teresa is considered to be a very nice person, very charitable person. But then what does that mean in the sight of Allah? Nothing. What good is that going to do her in, when she meets Allah? Absolutely nothing. And Gandhi, and you can think of many figures that the people have idolized in so many ways because of their manners and their characters and their attitude. We say this is a bonus to have uh, above and beyond Aqeedah. But without Aqeedah, it's useless. Ibadah, worship without Aqeedah is useless. And you have grave worshippers from among the Muslims, if we want to call them Muslims still, who spend, they do more Ibadah than all of us combined to a dead man. Seeking shafa and intercession from a dead man who himself has, has no control over his condition. He's, in, he's under the mercy of Allah. He can either be, uh, you know, uh, be receiving delight in, in the qabr or he could be burning in a pit from the pits of fire in the grave. And the people are outside telling him, Ya Fulan, Ya Abdul Qadir Al Jilani, help me, Umidri Ish. There are confusion. A lot of ibadah. A lot of ibadah. It's useless. Transactions without your honest and your dealings, beautiful. If you don't believe in Allah, it's not gonna bring, that currency of the dunya does not convert into good deeds and on Yawm Al Qiyam. You can have a huge bank account. The money is not the same currency that a person buys his spot in Jannah with. It's not. So someone can be very honest and therefore very prosperous in their dealings and business. It doesn't cut it for them when they meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he sent Mu'adh to the people of Yemen, he told them that the first thing that you invite them to is the first thing they should do is that they single Allah out in worship. If they obey you concerning that, then let them know that Allah has, has imposed five prayers upon them in the day and the night. And if they obey you concerning that, let them know that there's zakah, which is taken from the rich, given to the poor, and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, the first thing he was supposed to do is not debate with them on the side issues of Islam, Rather focus on Tawheed. Similarly, if you're giving da'wah to a non-Muslim and they start telling you about polygyny or polygamy, whichever term you prefer, and they start, why do women have to dress this way and why do women have to dress that way and why do you do this and why do you do that and what's up with this beard on your face and so on and so forth, and they try to divert you from the main topic, you could be qualified and answer these other questions, but you, or you could be unqualified and therefore you don't have to answer these questions. What we all have to do, whether qualified or unqualified, is be qualified to explain Tawheed. That we're not excused from not being able to deliver successfully. You're not excused. You can say, well, I don't know how to explain the logic behind women covering themselves up. And men don't have to cover themselves up. Why? He's a male. If you go into the logical world, especially with the atheists, it's a never-ending discussion. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry is a genius with an IQ of I don't know how much, and they want to argue with you on things which are agreed upon. Humans have agreed upon them from day one until today. Suddenly now, the things which are agreed upon are doubtful. And so that is a very slippery slope to even go there. But when you focus on Tawheed, and you establish it, you are actually hitting that area within their aql that is in line with what Allah created them upon. It's that fitrah. And they can successfully act. They can act out like you're not making any sense and that they're not convinced. But deep down, Allah knows. Allah knows that they are just in the state of denial. They are deliberately in the state of denial. Um... So let us discuss some of the uh, benefits of understanding Aqeedah. Because 
Aqeedah is that unshakable foundation. Aqeedah is the only thing that will help you pull through. Aqeedah is the only way out from all of the calamities that are befalling on us on daily basis from every side and direction. Nothing will help you maintain. If one's aqidah is, is shakable, if one's aqidah is weak, then you only have so much resistance before you give in. Your manners and your ibadat will only take you so far. If they're not built on this proper belief in Allah, then it will not be enough. It is not enough power, there's not enough fuel, there's not enough energy in those things to help you maintain. However, having the proper aqidah, even if one is deficient in the other areas, that aqidah bi'idhnillah will save them. What's the evidence? Who can think of an evidence to support? That's a big claim I just made. That you may be lacking in all these other areas. You may not have the best manners in the world. You're feisty and you fight with people. You have you know, bad manners. Or you could have uh, barely any ibadah. You barely do the, the obligations. No voluntary prayers, no voluntary fasting, and so on and so forth. However, if your aqidah is sound, then you have been promised salvation. What's the evidence? Yes, sir. If this, uh, this man on the Yom al Qiyamah, he will be presented with this cross of bad deeds. No. With a lot of uh, bad deeds, and only the card of La ilaha illallah will be shown. Barakallah fiq, bullseye. The hadith of Sahib al bitaqa It's known as the man with that ticket, if you want to call it. It's a ticket, it's a card. He will come on Yawm al-Qiyamah and he will have scrolls of, of evil deeds. You know what that means? You know that the, on Yawm al-Qiyamah, how do you weigh things? It's hasanat and sayyat. So for him to have so many bad deeds, meaning his, his uh, balance of good deeds was very small. To the point that خلاص, he already used it up and now what's remaining is all the bad deeds. Scrolls that reach the sky of evil deeds. To the point that he will make his self-declaration, I'm doomed. خلاص, is, well, there's no escape. Then Allah Azza wa Jalla will say, no, there's no oppression. لا ظلم اليوم. Today there will be no oppression. And a ticket, a card will be taken out that says on it, La ilaha illallah. It will be placed on the other side of the scale and then all the evil deeds will just fly. Fly off the scale and then that person will be forgiven and admitted to paradise. You cannot be any clearer than this. Now, by no means, and please, we are all mature and grown people, by no means is this an invitation to go follow our desires and live this terrible life and say, I have la ilaha illallah. And then hope that we will be that person. That is not the attitude. We're all intelligent enough not to take that route. This is, uh, this is something that will happen. No guarantee that it will be me or you. Therefore, that's not the approach. But it's a fact that we cannot deny either. It is a fact which cannot be denied. And that shows you. And that person who said la ilaha illallah must have said it from his heart. Because of the other evidences in shurut la ilaha illallah, he must have said it sincerely for the sake of Allah. He must have believed in it. He must have fulfilled its conditions in spite of one's shortcomings. So that tells us that if, if this is going to save you on yawm al-qiyamah, then it will definitely save you in the dunya. If on yawm al-qiyamah this word is enough, then in the dunya it is more than enough. So then why do we see people leaving Islam? Why do we see people abandoning the deen? Why do we see people, you know, going off track? It's because that aqidah and that la ilaha illallah was never established properly. It was never, it was, a, it was a mirage. They thought they had it all together, but they did not have it all together. And that's why there's, there's no playing around with this area. This is not something that we can take lightly. This is something that requires, uh, inst you have to instill this in your life in your children's life, in your family's life, and we are, and I'm not claiming that we're doing this so successfully. We ask Allah to forgive us for our sins. Don't, don't think because I'm telling you this, that means I have it all figured out. We all have many areas of improvement and a lot of shortcomings, but we know that this is the only solution. 
We know that this is the only solution. So, <clears throat> what are the benefits of learning and teaching Aqidah? First of all, you are following the methodology of the prophets. And we know that the most successful people Allah ever created in this dunya are the messengers. Al-Anbiya wa rusul And this is their methodology. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهِ we have sent amongst every nation a messenger declaring to the people, worship Allah alone and abandon false gods. And we have not sent a messenger before you, except that we inspired unto him that there is no deity worthy of worship except me, so let them worship me. Secondly, Aqeedah protects you from falling into shirk, Needless to say, and into innovation. One of the most two prevalent calamities and, and that have engulfed the Muslim Ummah. The reason why we are in this state of weakness that we are in today is primarily because shirk is widespread and shirk keep, makes you weak and then innovations are widespread. It, depending on where you go, you see um, crazy stuff. In the last trip uh, to Montenegro, you know Montenegro, anybody knows Montenegro, there's different ways of pronouncing it, I'm, I'm, I'm not really stuck on the words. It's a, it's a country out there near the Serbia and uh, Bosnia and you know, Croatia, these, these countries, what are they called, the Balkans or something. And we went to the masjid over there, we went to many masjid and prayed. And they have their own bid'ah. After the salah, they have some, some wild stuff. A brother, like the oldest one, I guess, in the group, he starts saying the athkar, athkar after salat that we don't know. Their own version of the athkar after salat. And then he will be quiet, then all of a sudden he says, like, and then the people will, and he silence, raises his voice, mumbles some words, and then, they, and then nobody leaves until he finishes. Then he finishes, then they leave. And he says, what's going on here? Okay, I saw it the first time, I thought maybe this is an issue in this masjid. <laughs> maybe we went to the wrong masjid. And then I realized when we visited many masjid, that was the same thing. This is now uh, part of the culture, Islamic culture of that country. And now you go to another country, they have, you know, after the salah, the imam turns around and he makes dua and everybody makes dua with him. Then everybody wipes their face. And that is their culture. That is their version of Islam. And then depending on where you go, you will see a different demonstration. Now, if you were to refer those actions to the sunnah, you might find that only 1% of them are actually valid. And the other 99% are homemade. You know, yaqawi, yaqawi, yaqawi. You know, the people who put their head, head on their head and they repeat different names of Allah. Where did this come from? Or the people who kiss their thumbs and they rub their eyes. Where did this come from? And I can enumerate, depending on where you go, all types of innovations. Subhanallah. And we are in a stage where if you address the issue, you're crazy. You're the crazy one. If you say, brother, what did you just do? It's like, what is your problem? <laughs> and the people will turn against you. Like you're some outcast who's bringing a new deen other than the one that they know. And it is true. You're bringing the real deen, which people don't know anymore. Had we been upon the right aqidah, we will know that only Allah legislates and he authorized the Prophet ﷺ to legislate and so whatever the messenger did is sunnah, whatever he abandoned is a bid'ah. And you will never enter this discussion of good sunnah and good bid'ah and what have you know, this whole the, you know, nonsense about there's good innovation. You will never have to go there. And once you don't go there, then you've saved yourself all types of additions and, and uh, you know, things that people have invented in the deen. Thirdly, uh, fourthly, Proper aqidah creates fear of Allah. Only when you are mindful that Allah is watching is when you have that sense of preventing yourself from falling into sin. And people that don't truly believe or they're not mindful of Allah, those are the ones who easily indulge in sinfulness. The believer has this remorseful attitude. When he does sin, he feels guilty, he repents to Allah. That is a sign of a live heart. And it's based on their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fifthly, being protected from the tribulations. 
مسيح الدجال uh, who will come at the end of time right many people will follow him many people will follow the false messiah uh, and the only people that will be saved are those who have the right aqidah and those who follow the sunnah and what does the sunnah teach us about protection from the dajjal what do you have to do to protect yourself from the dajjal Huh? Iman. Iman. Specifically, what from the Sunnah? Did you say Surah Al-Kahf? What about it? How many? First and ayat or last and ayat? No, there are multiple narrations. So it's either the first and ayat of Surah Al-Kahf or the last and ayat. Let's say all of them. To be on the safe side, so there are multiple narrations. Some narrations say the first ten, some say the last ten. You need to know the first ten and the last ten. How many people know the first ten and the last ten of Surah Al-Kahf? Exactly. Imagine now throughout our lives, how long we've been Muslims. Some of you, I'm sure, they read it on weekly basis. On weekly basis, you recite Surah Al-Kahf. But, but we haven't put that investment. Into memorizing 10 ayat, ya Sheikh. 10 ayat from here, 10 ayat from there. No matter how difficult it is, even if you're a foreigner in Arabic, it's not your mother tongue, it is doable. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ Allah has made the Qur'an easy to remember. That's why you remember. Surah Al-Akhlas and Mu'awidhatan and uh, Surah Al-Naba and whatever you memorize. What's the difference? This is Qur'an, the speech of Allah. This is Qur'an, the speech of Allah. It's doable. But... If we had the right aqidah, aqidah would have been that driving force for you to memorize those. Because you would think, La qaddar Allah, something happened, the Dajjal came around suddenly. I have my means to protect myself. So it's about knowing it and acting upon it. Now, um, sixthly, being able to fight against all of these uh, uh, ideologies, these modern ideologies that the people are inventing. You know, it's just crazy. The latest trend right now, which is being picked up by many of these organizations and institutes in the West, is the claim that a person only becomes a kafir, a person only becomes a disbeliever, when he denies a quality that belongs to Allah and attributes it to someone else. Meaning, if you say that Fulan has a entity, has a quality, of Allah, you're making that person divine, you're not a mushrik. Until you strap that, you remove it from Allah and you attribute it to that person. Only then, you're a mushrik. If you claim that someone else can do what Allah does, no problem. So if, if you say Allah is, uh, uh, for example, the one, the, the ever living, and fulan is the ever living, you're not a mushrik. Only when you say Allah is not ever living and this person is ever living that you become a mushrik. What kind of, what a crazy stuff is this? This is as crazy as it gets. This is a new innovation. Some so-called sheikh in the Arab world started this trend. Student of knowledge, supposedly, who know Arabic, heard it, they liked it. It fits into the Western uh, you know, infrastructure very well. In the Western world, this is very nice, a nice way to deal with the non-Muslims over there. So they adopted this new belief and now this is what these organizations are preaching major speakers are preaching this idea and these are all ide- if you had the proper aqidah you would, this is something you wouldn't even consider subhanallah if a man came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ma sha allah wa shi'at whatever allah wills and you will technically speaking it's okay right because don't you have your own will didn't allah say that you have your own will so, technically speaking, it is right to say whatever Allah wills and the Messenger wills. But the Prophet ﷺ became angry at that man's expression. And he said, Are you making me a rival or an equal with Allah? بَلْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ Rather, only what Allah wills alone, himself. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ was establishing these Ideas among the, the Sahaba. That's why the first 13 years, it was strictly da'wah to Tawheed. The actual acts of worship and the detailed acts of worship only reve- were revealed in Medina. 
in the Meccan phase, it was primarily establishing, and this is among the finest breed of human beings. You do know that the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ are superior to the Sahaba of Isa, and to the Sahaba of Musa, and to the Sahaba of every messenger. The Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ are the finest, of the, the most elite of all elite people. And it took 13 years. By who was giving them da'wah? Some fulan like myself? From nowhere? No, the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is how much investment was made. Today, we attend a course, <laughs> a crash course in Aqidah for one week. We come out, Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar, I'm ready. Ya Shaykh, take it easy, Habibi. This is not a one month course or a two month. This is a, a lifetime uh, uh, effort. It's a lifetime mission of learning Aqidah. The 99 names of Allah which we know of. You know what's, how many lessons are behind each name? Can any one of us here say, I know all of them and their meanings and their translations and their implications in our lives? I don't think so. Even students of knowledge will tell you, Wallahi, I'm still working on it. I'm at the 45th name, for example. That's the reality on the ground. Let alone regular people like us. So how can we say that we figured it out? We haven't. There's a lot to be done. Seventhly, with aqidah you remove ignorance from yourself. Um, and obviously, ignorance, there's a, there's a type of ignorance that is excused, and there's a type of ignorance that is not, never excused. So there are certain things which Allah Azza wa Jal will forgive the Muslims for. رَبَّنَا لَا تُوَأَخِذْنَا إِنَّ نَسِينَا أَوْ أَخْطَانَا Oh Allah, do not hold us accountable if we forget or if we make a mistake. And Allah Azza wa Jal say, قَدْ فَعَلْتْ That has been granted for the Muslims. And there are areas where we are not, not excused for our ignorance. And so, Aqeedah removes ignorance from oneself. So we know how to deal with natural disasters. We know how to deal with natural occurrences. We know how to deal with any calamity. It's that thing, that, that the anchor that keeps you in place. The actual anchor that keeps you in place is your aqidah. The world is full of tribulations. It's inevitable we will have to go through them at some point in time. What will keep you firm and with a peace of mind, with a tranquility, is, is your belief in Allah. Especially those who understand qadr. Those who understand qadr the most are the most relaxed people in this world. Those who have proper belief in Qadr of Allah are the most relaxed people in this world. Ya Shaykh, nothing bothers him. Nothing of the past and nothing regarding the future. They know it's Qadr of Allah. Because we, I'm speaking about myself, because we don't have that firm belief, we are so regretful over the past and so worried about the future. And it's a, it's a byproduct of not having the qadr and how Allah Azza wa Jal works and in His wisdom, in His legislation, properly understood. Uh, that's why some of the scholars say, proper aqidah is what will relieve you from anxiety, from stress, and from depression. If you're looking for a true solution, for dealing with anxiety and depression and sadness and worry, then proper aqidah is the only solution for that. You know that Allah Azza wa Jal has decreed everything. You know Azza wa Jal, Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal forgives the sins. You know Azza, Allah Azza wa Jal removes the calamities. So you call on Him and you supplicate to Him and you ask Him to keep you firm and to look after you and take care of you as He takes care of His righteous slaves. And it's, it's as simple as that. And you live your life accordingly. It doesn't mean that things will happen exactly as we wish them to. If, if it were this case, then we would become the gods, you know, the God in, in some technical way. And then uh, it's the other way around. Allah doesn't work by our rules and our, you know, preferences. It's Allah's wisdom that actually regulates what happens to us. We have to understand. It's not about what we ask for. It's about how Allah allows us to deal with what He decreed for us. You may ask for many things that are not good for you. 
And so Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who knows what is good and what is not. And we know that Allah does not decree for the believer except that which is good. عَجَبَ لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ فَإِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ خَيْرٌ Amazing is the affair of the believer. His whole affair is good. If something bad happens to him, he is patient. And this is good for him. And if something good happens to him, he is thankful to Allah. And that is good for him. And no one has that privilege except the true believer. Now, these are the benefits of having the proper aqidah. Let us look on the flip side. What are some of the consequences of not having the proper aqidah? Number one is al maishatu dunk. Who knows what that is? What have you heard this before? al maishatu dunk. Non Arabs first. Huh? Yeah, what, what is the ayah? You know the ayah, Shaykh? An dhikri fa inna lahu maishatan dunk. Jazakallahu khayran. So whosoever turns away from my remembrance shall have a miserable life. Ouch. Really ouch. Think about it. Think about all these celebrities and superstars and all these people with so much money. They literally don't know what to do with their money. They got so much money, they don't know where to spend it. Yet, they're not really happy. And of course, not all of them display that. A lot of them do. You hear about major rock stars and singers committing suicide, right? What was that guy from uh, Lincoln Park or whatever? Yeah, people that you, you would think that he's got it all and this and that. They're internally dying from depression. A lot of psychiatrists, ironically, who are supposed to be helping people deal with mental issues, <laughs> they, they, I guess they hear so much, they just go and kill themselves. The suicide rate among those people is higher than others from among doctors. And a doctor is someone you go for for help. He needs help. Right? You tell him so many, so many depressing stories, he gets more depressed. Like, uh, find another job, man. Go work in a restaurant, you know? Wait on tables and bring people their burgers and make them happy and put a smile on their face. Um, and so, the miserable life. And the ayah we mentioned earlier. Uh, secondly, if we don't have a proper aqidah, then what, we be, what becomes widespread among the people is selfishness. The person is no longer concerned about others. And the example they give, uh, it's okay if it stopped. The example they give is if that of a woman whose example, who, who wears makeup and beautifies herself in front of strangers. She doesn't care what that is going to how it's going to affect people. She's only concerned that she feels good about herself. And that's something understandable. You ask the woman, why do you do this? Or the woman who don't like hijab, they say, they say that we just want to, we want to be, you know, it makes me feel good about myself. They claim, some women claim that I don't wear makeup to impress others. I don't care about others. I'm doing it for my own, you know, self betterment. I feel good. Say, that's beautiful. That's very nice. That said, that's pretty selfish. Because at the end of the day, there's an impact. I mean, I also like to drive my car recklessly, you know, and drift when I c come into my street. But that means I could kill somebody, I could crash into the neighbor's car. And so, yes, while that makes me feel good about my driving skills, and I'm just being, I, I'm, I'm joking right now, don't think I do this. Uh, <laughs> some of you are looking at me like, seriously? I can imagine you in the gyms. Uh, that's it. I'm not. You know. You, that's selfish. So uh, when a person, when a person has a proper aqidah, they have that concern about others, how these things impact others, and so it becomes means of preventing them from being selfish. Thirdly, when there's no proper aqidah, then then crime becomes widespread, and we know this from other societies. Alhamdulillah, within Muslim societies, probably the least among the crime rate is the least. In other societies, when there's no concern about God, there's no belief in Allah, it's all about revenge. You know, you do me like this, I'm going to do you like that. It's all about taking revenge. There's no consideration uh, of forgiveness and compassion in, in the sense that they're looking for reward from Allah. And if they do it, they do it for sure. So we have that advantage over them. Fourthly, the corruption of the society. 
When there's no proper aqidah, the whole society is corrupt. Look anywhere in the Muslim world, you will understand what I'm saying. You will understand what I'm saying. So, for example, we, heard, we hold certain trainings, and when we go to certain trainings in other countries, work-related, we have amongst us fellow Muslims who, when, when drink alcohol is being offered on, you know, in certain places, they go get drunk. Muslims go get drunk. Or you get on an airplane, everybody's wearing jilbab. When you arrive at your destination, there's not even a single jilbab. And you wonder, were these the same people that boarded the plane with us earlier? Khalas, once you arrive in Dubai, it's <laughs> it becomes halal. It was only uh, haram in, in Saudi. Over there, it's, yeah, Sheikh. It's the same thing. You're not leaving the you're not leaving the dunya. You're not going to an area where you're no longer monitored by Allah and the malaika. It's the same thing. So societies become widespread, uh, corrupt. And it becomes widespread. The corruption becomes widespread. Had we had proper aqidah, no matter where you are, it's the same thing. Fifthly, less suicide rate, which I mentioned earlier. Again, a lot of uh, the people that are supposed to be helping others are themselves in need of help. Sixthly, the widespread of hatred and enmity amongst the people. And because when there's no proper aqidah, you don't have this belief of to love for your brother, what you love for yourself. And that is fundamentally an Islamic principle. To the point that you, you're an altruist. You prefer others over yourself. Something that we lack big time. But it is that part of belief. And you don't do this unless you believe that Allah will reward you for it. People don't want to give what they like to someone else. right? You want to like, you want to have what you like for yourself. What will make you give up what you like to give it to someone else except that you hope from Allah a big reward? So it's also related to aqidah. Seventhly, it prevents the widespread of, if we don't have proper aqidah, what becomes widespread is fear among the people and fairy tales and superstitious beliefs. And you can, you can see that manifesting in the, the whole Muslim world. People still believe in all types of superstitious stuff about umbrellas and salt and cats and so on and so forth, and they live in fear of ghosts, and, and if you go to this room, there's going to be a ghost, and so what made this thing turn on, and what made this, they live this kind of wahm. They're in constant fear. A person with proper aqidah, is like, what? What are you talking about? They don't care. They honestly, genuinely don't care. Their belief in Allah Azza wa Jal is what keeps them firm upon the deen. Eighthly, if a person, or if we don't have proper aqidah, a person will live a life of self-oppression. A person will lead a life of self-oppression. Why? Because aqidah is what reminds you of Yawm Al-Qiyam. And Yawm Al-Qiyam reminds you of accountability. And if you don't have that state of mind, you wouldn't really care. You would wind up doing whatever you like to do that is contemporary, that is uh, momentary, that is immediate type of pleasure, and you will not think about the long-lasting effects and consequences of those actions when you meet Allah. <laughs> if we have the proper aqidah, the proper aqidah, that will prevent us from having this attitude towards life. Not having this in mind will lead to much self-oppression, which is also prevalent. Uh, ninthly, you will not really lead a life. With no proper aqidah, your life is not really a life in the ultimate sense. It's just a human being with a soul living a number of years until they depart. There's no meaningfulness for this life. A meaningful life is one that is built on the proper aqidah. Uh, a regular life, like any other among the cattle that Allah created, is one where aqidah is not part of it. I mean, sure, the animals live. Animals survive. But what is their value? What values do they have? What are they looking forward to? In fact, as the ayat mentioned, some of the animals are superior to human beings. Allah said they are like the cattle, but they are more astray. Why? They act the cattle remember Allah. The cow knows la ilaha illallah. And the sheep knows la ilaha illallah. And the frog knows la ilaha illallah. And some humans don't know la ilaha illallah. We'll keep the questions till the end. Zakallah khair. And so the question remains, 
the question which we all have to ask ourselves is, what is Aqidah? Okay, that sounds nice. I like it. Can I go buy it from Danube? Do they sell it in bulk? Do they have any discounts? Buy one, get four free for my family? I buy one for myself, hook up the whole family. Is it something you install in your body? You know, and you have a compartment, you open it up, put the Aqidah chip, chip set in there, close it, then, oh, Alhamdulillah, I think I understand everything now. I'm ready to go. How do you get it? What is Aqidah and how do you get it? Let's get some uh, answers from the floor. What is Aqidah and how do you get it? That's a lot of answers. Calm down, guys. Yes, Mr. Volunteer. Accepting Islam the way it is? That's beautiful. I like that answer. Get more technical. To believe in Allah's messengers the last day. Aha. That's a very good point. You mentioned Iman. And the scholars have a discussion on this. Is Iman sufficient? Or is Aqidah beyond that? It's actually not enough. Iman is not enough independently of the proper Aqidah. Why? Because you could believe in Allah incorrectly and his malaika incorrectly and in his books incorrectly and in Yawm al-Akhir incorrectly. You could have all the Iman elements but they're not upon the proper creed. So while Iman is, is a given but it's actually what you believe about these six pillars of articles of faith. When you say, La ilaha illallah, let's say, and tu'mina billah, tamam? Now bring five Muslims from five parts of the world and ask them a simple question about Allah. You will probably get five different answers, akhi. If you bring a Jew and a Christian, now you have 15 answers because each Jew or Christian will have another seven in his mind. I don't know if I did the math correctly. And if you do, and you, the more you bring, the more answers you will get. Define, define God, if you want to use the English term God. Define God. Who is Allah? Who can define Allah Azza wa Jal? Or if you were to give them an attribute of Allah, what do you understand of it? You will find many answers. Say the anger. Is anger a quality of Allah? I mean, I'm going to trick you right now. Watch how many will fall. Is anger a quality of Allah? Yes or no? No? Fadal, in this, in this hall, we got two conflicting answers. We have yes and no. What's, what's the evidence for the yes, yes, Sheikh? Because uh, we all know that, I mean, if you are, if you are not rightful in this world, I mean, we will be in hell. So that shows the anger of Allah. No. Nope. That's deduction by logic. That's beautiful. But when we don't use logic to understand Allah Azza wa Jal. While I understand you, that is actually the incorrect answer from an Aqidah point of view. Huh? MashaAllah, Tabar. Tfaddal, Ya Sheikh. Because this was not, this, uh, was this, this attribute was, that was not taught by Prophet Muhammad He did not mention this. this is oh, so you're of the opinion that Allah doesn't become angry? This is not an attribute of Allah. <laughs> it's not? Wow. Bam. Okay. That's good. Yeah, I understand that you're saying the hadith that that nah, fine. That, that's a little far. Get me something that is way right in your faces, guys. Allahu Akbar. Give me one. Surah Al-Fatiha, Jama'at Al-Khair. Sirat Al-Ladina An'amta Alayhim. Ghayri Al-Maghdub. You know what? Maghdub Alayhim, those whose Allah's anger is upon. How are they going to have the anger of Allah if Allah doesn't become angry? Hey. Allah became angry with them. 
What you're saying is, it's not a name of Allah. <laughs> Brother, you have the uh, names of Allah, Asma'ullah, and you have the sifat, the attributes of Allah. Not every attribute is a name. So yes, Allah didn't call himself Al-Ghadib, or the Prophet ﷺ didn't call Allah Al-Ghadib, agreed. It's not a name of Allah, but it's an attribute of Allah. It's, an, it's one of the most important attributes of Allah. And it's in Surah Al-Fatiha. Now, we can use the same, I can ask you another six, seven, and trust me, we will probably have a similar interesting discussion. But this is exactly what I am referring to. Aqeedah is not merely Iman. Because anyone right now you say, do you believe in Allah? Say, wallah, wallah, I believe in Allah. Why would I come to this lecture? If I didn't believe in Allah, I'd be at the beach right now. Belief in Allah brought me here. Say, Zakallah khair, I, I, I believe you. But go dig deeper, you'll find that there, there's a lot of loopholes. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of misunderstanding. So Aqeedah is actually knowing who Allah is. Some Muslims will tell you Allah doesn't become angry. Why? Because they say that that is not a, a quality or that is, is blameworthy, right? Because the Prophet ﷺ said to a man, huh? لا تغضب, don't become angry. So they say, now this is the logic which I was afraid of. Watch out for logic. Watch out for logic. What made the Muslims deviate in the area of names and attributes is logic, supposedly. Logic says, if the Prophet doesn't want a man to be angry because angry is a blameworthy trait, then how can you attribute this to Allah? A'udhu billah. Ye? Look, Allah says maghdub alayhim in the Quran. Put your logic aside. This is something established already. It's not open for my opinion and yours. You understand what I'm saying? Some people say Allah is not Rahim. <coughs> Muslims who say Allah is not merciful. Why? They say merciful is weakness. Right? The boss who's too merciful cannot manage the business as well as someone who's firm. So then they take away mercy from Allah. And the list goes on. Let alone when you enter the area of Allah having a face, subhanahu wa ta'ala, or Allah having eyes, or Allah having hands, all established in the Quran and the Sunnah. Those are even more difficult upon them to understand. If they struggle with the abstract, if we may call them attributes, when it comes to the ones that are established in the Quran and Sunnah, by all means, any Muslim who is not upon the right aqidah will deny. You tell him Allah has a face, he will tell you no, and he tell you, no way. No way. But Allah says, Allah says in the Quran, uh, says, well, this means something else. How does this mean something else? Did the Prophet ﷺ tell to the Sahaba this means something else? No, he didn't. What does that word mean in Arabic? It means face value. It's a face. How do you deny it, Yahi? Logic or philosophy. And the list goes on. Therefore, when we say aqidah, brothers and sisters, don't take it as a light. As a light word or a chipset that you can install in your system and you're good to go. This is an intensive study that is lifetime requiring. It, it, you don't end. You may, you know, breathe your last breath, breath and you still haven't encompassed the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which are many that we know of. And like I said, the attributes are a lot more than the names. So while you might have memorized the names of Allah, Asma'ullah al-Husna, you still have a long to go with the attributes of Allah, which don't have names connected to them. Like makr. What is makr? Plotting. Allah plots. Right or wrong? What's the evidence? When Surah Al-Tariq, Kaid also. إِنَّهُمْ يَكِيدُونَ كَيْدَ Allah plots subhanahu wa ta'ala but the, the plotting independently is, may also be blameworthy so it's always in the context of retaliation to the plotting of the disbelievers regardless it's an attribute of Allah but it's not a name of Allah you don't say Allah is al-makir because if you say it independently it's not praiseworthy and Allah has al-asma al-husna it's the beautiful names <coughs> very important area brothers and sisters and it's wallahi more important than fiqh salah And it's more important than fiqh zakah And it's more important than the rules of fasting in Ramadan. 
and it's more important than anything you can imagine in this world. This is the most important period. Once you have established that unshakable foundation, now you can start decorating your house. You want to build a house? You begin with this, that infrastructure. And you have strong material, not the cheap stuff you buy from uh, Bagala, the, the real stuff. Once you have it, now you can make a nice wall. You want to get a creative with the wall. You want to use different paint. You want to put air conditions. You want to put chandeliers. That, that's your business. And that is your akhlaq, and that is your ibadah, that is the mu'amala. Those are all the other things. But building all these things, beginning with the wall and the air condition and the decoration, and your foundation is weak. As soon as there's a thunderstorm or there's a wind, strong winds or a storm, your whole house is gone. Your whole house, and this is what we see today. People might have done all of this, but there was no proper foundation, and the typhoon came, and everything was gone. Subhanallah, you wonder why? Wallahi, it's because the foundation was never sound. It was never sound. So the, the idea is, this is where you begin, and this is where you actually end. That should be the focus. Uh, fortunately for us, by Allah's mercy, there's ample material already. It's not like we say, oh, Allah, that's a good idea, brother. I know already. Can we start doing Aqidah classes once a week? And then one week you can come, one week you can't, one week I'm traveling, one week I'm not. And then it's already done. I give you the glad tidings. Anything you want to learn about the subject matter has already been delivered and compiled and made available for free by multiple speakers that are reliable, inshallah. Because you cannot take this information from just anybody. Obviously, everybody has their own twist if they're upon the right aqidah or not. But that material is already out there. If you really want to know about the names and attributes of Allah, I recommend that you listen to Brother Muhammad Tim Humble, who has plenty of material going over the names and attributes of Allah. This is minus the books that have already been authored. There are books in English authored about this topic. You might prefer to read, you might prefer to listen, you might prefer to watch. All of these means of learning, the visual and, and uh, audi uh, audible, whatever, not audible, what is the word? I can't think of it now, whatever. All of these are available. Choose your preference. Learn in whichever way you like to learn, but you must learn. You must, you must make it happen. You have a daily schedule, input this into your daily schedule. Make it, just like you eat, do you skip a day? You don't skip a day of eating. This is food for your soul. This is food for your soul, for your salvation, for Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Don't skip a day. Even if it's five minutes, ten minutes, small bites, small tiny bites. Do it. Make it part of it. With time, it will progress. It will prosper. Allah will bless it. You will find that peace of mind that you're looking for. So you know that if the dunya doesn't work out for you, you know that the akhirah is guaranteed. Really, because the dunya, there's no promise that it will work out for any one of us. But at least we have the akhirah guaranteed. So ask Allah Azza wa Jal to facilitate that. And speaking of aqidah, if you like to know more about the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, which is the most important thing for you to know, on the, on the uh, website onewaytoparadise.net, that's O N E W A Y T O P A R A D I S E dot N E T. There's no numbers, digits, uh, symbols, nothing. Just one word, one way to paradise. Dot net. There's a tab called Aqida under audio, and there's the complete book of Al Aqida Al Wasitiya by Sheikh Al Sabah bin Taymiyyah with the Sharh Sheikh bin Uthaymin. Complete book in MP3 files. You download it. You listen to it while you're driving to work, whatever your time allows, when the sister's cooking and taking care of her house, uh, household chores, you, at, at your convenience, because it's just, you're, you can multitask, you can listen and do something else at the same time. This is one, one quick fix, if I may say, because it addresses those, those main important things. And then you can you know, supplement that with other material and other content until you get there. That is more important than admonishments. It's nice to be reminded of Allah. It's nice to be, you know, admonished. But those are, they have short effect. 
You know, anytime you go to Jum'ah, the khatib might deliver that khutbah that shakes your essence. And you, for three days, you go straight. And then on the fourth day, you fall back. You understand? Admonishments have short-term effect. Admonishments on top of proper aqidah, that's what the solution is. That's what will last longer. Insha'Allah ta'ala. So we ask Allah Azza to make that uh, easy upon all of us and help us acquire this knowledge and help us act upon it and spread it among the people and teach it to our kids. If you have any questions, we can have the Q&A session right now, insha'Allah. So, uh, what's the most proper definition for Aqidah? Aqidah comes from the word, yes, a definition, it's your creed. It's, it's translated into creed in English, and it's basically that which you hold on to firmly. Because Aqidah comes from Uqdah. Uqdah is a knot. You know, you tie a knot. And you tie it strong so that whatever you're trying to keep connected doesn't fall apart. That's what aqidah is. like tying a knot about your iman pillars. It's not just believing in them. It's believing in them properly, firmly, strongly, permanently. So that it, it doesn't become shaken or loose. We already got some questions? Alright. That's the first. Zakallah khair. What did I tell you? <laughs> Uh, now, if Allah has decreed upon a, upon a certain person to be in hell, what is the use of doing or trying his best to do good in this world, hoping to be in Jannah? Very good question. And I've delivered a whole lecture answering this question. Um, and that was the lecture about Qadr. I'm trying to remember the title of the lecture. Uh, subhanallah. Anyways, hopefully one of the kids or somebody will remember the, the title of the lecture. The lecture is about Qadr. I can later, inshallah, post it on Facebook. But I'm going to give you the simple answer. If someone knows Allah decreed for them hell, if someone, if Allah has decreed hell for someone, what's the point of them doing any good deed to go to Jannah? The retaliation is, how do you know? How do you know that Allah decreed hell for you? And therefore, what's the use of working? No one can answer that question. You, among everybody else, is among the rest of us who are unknown. We don't know. Okay, that said, did Allah give us a roadmap, a roadmap that leads to Jannah and a roadmap that leads to hell? Yes. Did Allah promise that if you do the things which will lead you to Jannah and you avoid the things that will lead you to hell, He will place you in Jannah? And not place you in hell? Yes. Do you trust Allah? Yes. Khalas. Your job is to do exactly that. Your job is to do exactly that. And if, if a human being betrays you, meaning I tell you, look, if you work for me for one month, I'm going to give you 7,000 riyals. Then you work for one month, I tell you, ma'asalama. Khuruj nihai. I can do this, right? Humans can do this to humans. Do you believe Allah do, does this to humans? No, khalas. This belief in Allah's names and attributes guarantees you that Allah will never tell you that He will, if you do what is right, He will reward you. And if you avoid what is wrong, He will protect you, that He will turn around and do something up, the opposite of that. And so since you don't know and you don't know, act accordingly. But anyways, the title of the lecture, subhanAllah, what is it? Ah, ajib. Oh, let me go first, come first, serve. Uh, how or what is the best way of explaining to young boys and girls that, that entering into a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship is haram? Whoa! Whoa! I did not see this one coming. Um, well, yeah. There's a lecture on this topic titled The Fine Line. The Fine Line. I recommend that you watch it. It's on YouTube. But to give you a brief answer, you explain to them very, uh, in a simple way, that Allah Azza wa Jal created human beings and He made the male and the female compatible and they complete each other. And He gave them multiple ways of fulfilling this kind of need that they have for each other. Only one 
is halal and all the other ones are haram. The only one that is halal is marriage because it involves uh, commitment, it involves appreciation, it involves a lot of other things. And it's the, the, the lawful channel that Allah blessed and promised to bless and it's the means to produce children. And He gave many alternatives that He commanded us to resist. Otherwise, we will become like the animals, like cats in the street. Uh, a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship is like two cats in the street. There's, it's because boyfriends and girlfriends often change. They go through multiple. Uh, and some will say, well, my situation is different. I'm going to be loyal to my girlfriend until, we marry, until I marry her. Say so, yeah, that you are going to be disobeying Allah until you marry her. That's going to be a rough marriage. I'm telling you from now. So... Yeah, and the lecture of the fine line should give you more reasons and wisdom behind it, but that requires a lecture of its own. The lecture on Twitter is named Do I Have a Choice? Do I Have a Choice? Barakallah Feek. Uh, that's why the, the, the sound came on. It. The lecture on Qadr is titled Do I Have a Choice? Please watch it. Can you recommend names of books and websites in English to learn 99 names of Allah? I already mentioned. Um, I don't, the, there's a book called The 99 Names of Allah in English. Uh, I can post the link, inshallah, on the Facebook page. And the, um, like I said, listen to Muhammad Tim Humble. If you would prefer to listen, he has a nice series on this, inshallah. Yeah, you said counselors and psychologists are, get depressed by taking so many broken cases. So is uh, counseling a field of psychology bad? What should be the right approach? I, I cannot say it's bad. Um, I'm just basing it on statistics and what we've mentioned. And often, oftentimes, because it's not, if they're not doing this the Islamic way, then you're bound to be told to you know, listen to some calming music or something. They're going to they're gonna give you advice that is contrary to the deen and that can never bring good results. You know what I mean? And lastly, we already have, we already have ruqya, we have remedy, we have so many prophetic ways of dealing with these things. We have adhkar, particular adhkar and adhkar for depression, for anxiety from the Prophet ﷺ. And so those coupled with the proper belief, in my humble opinion, are more than enough. Muslims back in the day didn't need to see any psychiatrist to deal with what's going on. If they didn't need it back then, I have the opinion that they don't need it today. And so if you're trying to go in that field, I personally don't recommend it. Plus it requires a lot of seclusion. If you're a sister, uh, you're not going to have the brother come in with his wife because he has a problem with his wife. That's why he's there to begin with. <laughs> uh, that is... Uh, MashaAllah, nice handwriting. How would you suggest we begin learning about the names and attributes of Allah? I already mentioned that in the lecture. You, you uh, in, incorporate it into your daily schedule, your weekend schedule. I don't know, each one of you knows how to sort out your own schedule. But it has to be something that you take seriously. It's not some luxurious, uh, you know, act that you engage in whenever you are in the mood for it. We have to take it, uh, speaking of myself, we have to take it more seriously. We have to incorporate it into our daily lives at portions that are doable for you. But make it something that is just like eating because it is more important. You mentioned there are many available lessons on Aqidah online. Can you mention a few of them? I answered that question earlier with the uh, one way to paradise.net. A lot of people ask others to read Surah Yasin for their deceased relatives or friends. Is there any basis for this practice? Yes, there is basis for it and it is not authentic. The hadith about the virtues of Surah Yasin uh, being recited for the dead, from my understanding, are based on weak narrations. And the scholars who are of the opinion that it is, um, excuse me, that it is not a weak narration, they say this is for the person who is in the state of dying. Yani if you are uh, witnessing the, the, the departure of someone from this dunya, you can recite Surah Yasin. For that person while someone else is telling him to repeat La ilaha illallah. Uh, because that's the last thing you want him to say. Not that after someone dies, you sit at home and recite Surah Yaseen. That has absolutely no basis. Uh, moreover, others ask guests to read Quran in the house of the deceased when visiting to give condolences for the purpose of bringing barakah to the household and not to read on behalf of the dead. All of these are bid'ah. These are all reprehensible innovations that have no basis. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, People weren't even allowed. People would not even sit at home and wait for people to come and give them condolences. Did you know that? If they made food, 
If someone died in their family and then they made food and they waited for people to come, that would be considered by the Sahaba a form of wailing. It was considered a form of wailing. You know what wailing means when you start beating yourself, meaning you're not happy with the qadr of Allah. They didn't have any of these practices. The sunnah was that when someone dies, you bring food to the family of the deceased. You don't go eat at their house and drink gahwa and shai and uh, cookies. You bring them food to help them during their times of difficulty. And the condolences are offered on, I met you, I came across you basis. Not that it was made as an arrangement. Now, that said, some of the scholars kind of take it easy and they say because of our lifestyles, busy schedule, for facilitation purposes, there's no harm that they wait for particular hours. And some of the scholars in all honesty allow that, like Sheikh Ibn Baz rahimahullah, he allows that. And so if you want to do that, that's fine. If you want to go and visit them, during, but you bring food with you, you don't go there to eat. But absolutely no Quran recitation. Or a qari, they bring a qari and they pay him a bunch of money and he recites Quran with lights and light bulbs around red chairs and all the stuff that you see. This is all not from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba. Uh, you know, they, they detested this kind of behavior. What are trusted sources to learn Aqidah? Um, in all honesty, it's all of the websites that are upon the way of the Salaf. Bear in mind that a lot of them have a lot of nonsense there as well. So while the Aqidah is being promoted successfully on these websites, they also have a lot of information that you definitely don't need about Fulan being deviant and Fulan being this and Fulan being I don't know what. And a lot of nonsense and just a waste of time and things that hard in the heart that we don't need. So the websites that promote the way of the Salaf are where you learn Aqidah. But restrict yourself to the beneficial articles that don't involve the opinions of Fulan about Fulan. Unless it's something that is clear cut evident. You know, there are some people that have to be warned against sadly in this Muslim Ummah. Because if you don't, the Ummah will be harmed. But some have taken this to a level that is beyond acceptable. So be careful of that inshallah. You mentioned Aqidah is more important than even good manners. How do you strengthen or ensure you have good Aqidah? By listening to this lecture again. Um, is Iman a prerequisite of Aqidah? Uh, yeah, well, they, they complete each other. You cannot have Aqidah without Iman. And you cannot, you cannot benefit from the Iman without proper Aqidah. So it's, it's about having the proper Aqidah regarding to your Iman. Your iman is defined by what you believe about Allah, His Malaika, and so on and so forth. Can you recommend names of books or websites? Oh, I did this already. Type. How or what? I'm confused. Me? Yes, bro. How could you practice Aqidah in deeds? Not in words. Every act of worship that you do, as is, if it's built on this proper aqidah, which is a sincerity, that will generate sincerity and fall on the sunnah, this is how you implement it. Meaning, there isn't anything extra in terms of worship that you will do because you have proper aqidah. The manifestation of it is the, in the value of your good deeds. The value of your worship will be raised and it will become fruitful when you base it on the proper aqidah. Versus... When you don't have the proper aqidah, the value of your deeds or your acts of worship is nothing. You lose the value. You can get a little bit or possibly nothing. But there isn't anything extra. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. Uh, as, we, as we as a new reverted Muslim, I'm curious about the meaning of the beautiful uh, reckoner. Uh -huh. al Hasib. And I can't read the other one, Wallah. Al Hasib and Al. Al Muham, Al Hasib from Hisab, you know, Yawm Al Hisab, is the one who holds uh, people accountable. And, and that, what that means is you understand that uh, every single thing that we do is fi kitab mubin. Every single deed is written uh, that they are kiraman uh, katibir. Angels, uh, noble, honorable angels that write down what you say. You don't say any word except that there are two angels writing it down. It's an understanding that nothing will be left out 
on Yawm al Qiyamah. Allah will reckon everyone for what they have done. فَيُجَازِ الَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا بِالْحُسْنَةِ He will reward those who have done good with excellence and then he will reward those who have done evil with what they deserve. It's a very basic. But the bottom line is knowing that you cannot escape on Yawm al Qiyamah. Even our skin, our hands, our eyes, everything will bear witness against us. So it's that a proper understanding that will generate the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. Some say that only the Quran and Sunnah are important. How do we convince them that we need to learn Aqeedah as a subject? Yeah, because the Quran and the Sunnah, how do you understand them without the proper Aqeedah? The Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, is an area where a lot of people have deviated in terms of how they understand it and how they implement it. So Aqeedah is that, is that, found, is that uh, the foundation upon which you understand Quran and Sunnah. Don't you think the Shia, they claim that they follow the Quran and the Sunnah? By all means, they have their own Quran, some of them, and they have their own Sunnah. And every deviant madhab in this Ummah is also saying we follow the Quran and the Sunnah. So this is how he answer them. Say, but everybody, even though we differ, says the Quran and the Sunnah. What determines the right from wrong? The proper Aqeedah. The proper Aqeedah regarding the Quran and the Sunnah. Uh, does akhlaq come under a, a sound aqidah? As you mentioned, that aqidah is more important. Yes. The scholars say that akhlaq, good manners, is part of aqidah because manners is not only how you deal with people, it's only how you deal with, it's also how you deal with Allah. So some people have good manners with Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is part of the aqidah in that sense. Where and how to start with people who have less understanding of aqidah or ignoring it? They claim that they believe, but it's. It's not manifested. Well, I mean, it's not manifested, that's, that's unacceptable. That is unacceptable. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَإِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ لَمُضْغَ إِذَا صَلُحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ Verily, in the, in the human body, there's a morsel, there's a piece of flesh. If it is sound, then the whole body will be sound. And that is the heart. So anyone who comes and claims that their outside actions don't interfere with their heart, we say this is unacceptable according to the Quran and the Sunnah. It's unacceptable. According to the teachings, if you, if you have a sound heart, it will manifest outwardly. That said, we are all full of sins. It doesn't mean that if we sin outwardly, that means that we have a corrupt aqidah. That now falls under that variable of human error, human weakness whispers of the shaitan and so a person falls into sin then they get back on their feet and they repent to Allah and that's how we all live our lives we go through our ups and downs and our good behavior bad behavior worship of Allah the lack of it we go through a lot of changes no issues this is how a human survives as in the hadith of the prophet when he told the sahabi Sa'atun wa sa'a. you have one hour of worship of Allah and another hour of being normal, in a sense, to be normal that you don't have to constantly engage in the worship of Allah. You spend time with your wife, you spend time with the kids, you go play sports, you play around, you enjoy yourself. No issue. As long as you're not, you know, turning away from the fundamentals. And so that's how we all live our lives. Yes, Akhi? Because, um, a teacher at school told us that depending on the time, how the music is, it's how it's going to be. So no, the, what, the, depending on the time that music can be haram and other times it can be halal. That's a nice one right there. Okay, I'll tell you what they're saying, right? I'm, I'm going to assume good about this teacher. He means, no seriously, he means that during Eid and during a wedding, uh, young girls are allowed to beat a drum while they chant. And that is true. If that is a form of music that Islam allowed in these two unique occasions, Eid and wedding, period, period. Anything beyond that is no longer allowed. I have a lecture on this topic called the classical hit, it's bad. We go over all the evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah. There are seven narrations from the Prophet ﷺ about the ruling on music and what they call Islamic nasheed. And so the lecture is a lengthy one, but it goes over all of these discussions. So you, once you hear, inshallah, you will understand, you will know how to identify yourself, what's okay, what's not okay, and when and so on and so forth. Is it special for women? 
Yes, that restriction for Eid and for uh, wedding is only for women. Now, see, women get to have a lot more fun than we do. <laughs> Contrary to what many say. Uh, do we have a duty towards parents to constantly deliver the right message like we do with the children? Absolutely. Absolutely. That said, I don't know what you're referring to, but you have to be very careful with giving da'wah to parents. Whether your parents are non-Muslims and you're trying to bring them to Islam, or your parents are Muslims with a lot of mistakes. The most delicate, sensitive thing in the world is trying to guide your parents who by default believe that you know less than they do. They brought you into existence and now you're the genius who wants to educate them. So there's a natural resistance, except a small minority of parents. The general fundamental principles that the parents, they reject learning from their kids. Subhanallah. It is what it is. Except really uh, righteous parents who usually don't need your da'wah, right? Who already know what's up. But those who are not on that level, you have to be very careful not disrespecting them or belittling them or looking down upon them in the context of trying to guide them to Islam. The father of Ibrahim was يعني, uh, not only a, a mushrik, he was making false gods. He used to sculpture them. And yet Ibrahim says, Ya Abati, Ya Abati, oh my dear father. If you want to translate that to English, my dear beloved father, I fear. I fear for you from Allah, from a punishment. He, the way he, Ibrahim gave da'wah to his father. And we learn this, we learn this from, from, you know, from many Isa and so on. So we learn this from many, many con, uh, uh, examples in the Quran. So please be careful when it is obligatory. It is obligatory to, to guide them. But you cannot use the same means you use with your friend or someone who is inferior to you or someone who is younger than you or someone who is lesser than you. No way. With your parents, there's a fine line between uh, undutifulness and you know trying to give them da'wah you can easily go from trying to give them da'wah into becoming undutiful to your parents and you know have them being angry with you and you don't want to go there you don't want to go there your parents have the greatest right after Allah and his messenger even if they are disbelievers even if they are disbelievers <coughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing uh, the worst sin after shirk is <laughs> being undutiful to your parents Allah says, وَإِنْ جَهَدَكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبُهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَةً If they both strove, they were striving against you to make you commit shirk, don't obey them, but keep excellent company with them in this life. That's a Quranic guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be careful. How to deal with people who uh, believe in Creator but they don't believe in any religion. They studied Aqidah but chose to be non-Muslim. Allah understand. Those are the mo to me, these are the most difficult people in the world. Uh, contrary to what have said, that uh, giving da'wah to an atheist is easier than a Jew or a Christian because he already has la ilaha. So now you only have to do illallah. No way, Jose. Those who have given da'wah to atheists, they, we know. I've gone through many of them. Whether those who were atheists from scratch or Muslims who left Islam and became atheists and we try to bring them back to Islam. Man, you have to have the greatest form of patience in the world to hold yourself from, from wanting to strangle this person. In terms of how much irritation you get. Because it's, you know, like people can bother you by just being so annoying. Like, you know how someone can be so annoying? They are the most annoying people in the dunya. Subhanallah, because you know, it, it's, it's if someone curses your parents, like imagine someone cold bloodedly says, Your parents are, are evil, your parents are, are whack, your parents are crazy. And, and they, how do you feel? Do you, are you gonna have anger building up? And, and that person is like being so cool about it, like it's not a big deal. And imagine if they were lying, and you have the best parents in the world, and someone, to, those people are saying something like this about Allah, who is more beloved to us than our parents. And I've had arguments with them. They said, you know, we came from uh, gravity. Gravity collided with molecules in the world. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And this is how we came. I said, okay, who made? Who made gravity? And what he said, he said, I don't know who, but it doesn't have to be Allah. I said, yeah, Shaykh, too much. 
شو يعني ايه؟ I don't know who but it doesn't have to be Allah. What kind of answer is this? It's very frustrating. So to me, those are the most difficult people to give down. Of course, I've never strangled anyone. Don't misunderstand me. We keep cool and calm and you know, smile on the face. I'm telling you my internal affair. Internally, how frustrated I am. But in reality, I'm, you know, I keep my composure. But they're very difficult to, give, give, difficult to give da'wah to. That's why I don't recommend that you go there unless you bring a qualified person. If you're unqualified, they will, t they will uh, twist it and they will flip the script on you. And next thing you know, you are in a position right now where you can't even defend yourself. And I've had many people that were unqualified try to give da'wah to someone who gave da'wah to them. Then they come back to you and say, brother, help. I was get, uh, telling this atheist, he told me this. Now I really don't understand. I said, ah, oh, Shaykh. Now I have to explain to you. Until why? What are you doing with this guy to begin with? So don't go there if you're not qualified. They're crazy. Uh, how can we avoid the squeezing punishment of the grave? By leading a righteous lifestyle. I mean, nobody's going to be able to escape the, the squeezing of the grave, by the way. It's according to the authentic hadith, this Dhamma uh, Al-Qabr, that hug, if we may call it, everybody's going to go through it. But of course, the believers will not feel the, the consequences and the pain. And for the disbeliever or the sinful person, it will be, it will be pretty painful. But uh, in general, I'm assuming you're avoiding the bad end. To, have a, to avoid a bad end, you have to have a good life. It's simple as that. If you've missed so many prayers previously, but you start praying all of your prayers now, what can you do to be, uh, not to be accountable for those salahs you missed? It depends on what opinion you follow. There are two opinions for the scholars. One that says the one who doesn't pray is a non-Muslim. He is a non-Muslim. If you stop praying, you've left Islam, goodbye, you're out. And another opinion that says if you've left Salah, you're a Muslim who's disobedient. If you follow the first position, which is leaving prayer entails abandonment of Islam, then the only solution is that you start praying and whatever's happened in the past, you're not accountable for because you were a disbeliever anyways. So now you have to start from scratch. The scholars who say that when you left Salah, you were still a Muslim, but you are sinful, require that you make up all these Salawat. By praying each prayer twice. Yani al dhuhr you pray four rak'at for one of the ones you missed, and four rak'at for today. And Asr and Maghrib and so on and so forth. Until you believe you have a gauged how many years you've missed and how many years you need to make up, along with recommending a lot of voluntary prayers to, you know, complement whatever you've missed. And so, depending on which position you follow, you will have to act accordingly. Yes? Harsh? Yep. Allah's name is the most merciful. And Allah says in the Quran, يَوْمَ نَقُولُ لِجَهَنَّمْ هَلْ امْتَلَأْتِ فَتَقُولُ هَلْ مِنْ مَزِيدٍ In spite of Allah's mercy, human beings will willingly earn their place in the hellfire. The majority of them. The majority of human beings will earn their place in Jahannam. So it's not an issue with Allah's mercy, it's an issue with humans. Similarly, the one who abandons Salah is basically telling Allah, I'm not interested in being your slave. I mean, Allah created you and gave you eyes and ears and mouth and brain and body and everything you have. Every food you eat, every breath you take. He gave you all this and then you want to enjoy it all the same. But I cannot give you anything back. I'm too busy. No problem. You can be busy for 60 years. When the 60 years are over, don't come ask for anything. Fair? It's fair. It's fair and square. So it's not harsh. It's actually fair. Some say that only the Quran and Sunnah is important. Oh, no, we, oh okay, I've, I've finished those. Um, so if you, mean, if you mean the psychology is mixed with Islamic teachings, Islamic counseling, is that allowed? Because mental illness does exist. People do need counseling mentally and emotionally, and we don't have enough Islamic counselors. Yeah, I didn't, I'm not, uh, yani I can, I'm not in a position to tell you uh, do, do this or don't do that, or I'm declaring this uh, science to be invalid. It's not, none of my business. I have my view, my humble opinion, which you are free to accept or reject. In my humble opinion, this whole business is not necessary. I believe if we had the right tools and elements, we will not be in need of this. 
the truth remains that we are lack, lacking in these areas of aqidah and so on and so forth and so this becomes another means for people um, if it's done in an Islamic way then do you really have to call it psychology? it becomes just the, the sunnah of the Prophet and dealing with remedy it's a, it's a form of spiritual uh, treatment for someone's illness you want to call it psychology? that's fine but when you go to college or university and you learn psychology no one is going to give you the hadith of the Prophet that is based on a dua you make to Allah they're going to give you something else and from my understanding very often it's it's not really Islamic at some point you will be asked to do something that is not Islamic and that defeats the purpose because sins don't help um, one thing is no worship or partner be qualified to be able to explain Tawheed having proper Aqidah but lack of brothers okay, but I, 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 where's the question? Maybe that's a, it's just a, maybe someone's notes. I missed the question in it. If the parents are self-sufficient and if they use it extravagantly, so do we still have to give them a portion of money as is, is if not given, they will get upset? Yes. Yes. The Prophet ﷺ said to a man, Anta wa maluka li abik. You and your money belong to your father. This is just straight up. You and all your money, you got cars, you belong to your father. Which means, which means that whatever the parents ask for, you have to give. However, the scholars add a condition that it doesn't harm you. Yani, if you need X amount of money for your survival, and your parents are asking you for an amount that will affect your well-being, this is where you can draw the line. This is where you can say, I can't because now it's having a negative effect on you. As long as you're able to do so, as long as you're able to do so, give. And remember that you're dealing with Allah, not with your parents. When you give them, know that when you give them, know that Allah Azza wa Jal knows that you need this money and he knows that they are going beyond their need and Allah Azza wa Jal will reward you for this either in the dunya or the akhirah that's why we have the iman aqidah see how everything connects to aqidah what does aqidah say what do we believe ma naqasa malun min sadaqa no wealth has ever been decreased because of charity understand this no wealth has ever been decreased because of charity. Let charity to some random person in the street, let alone an act of worship that entails sabaka and keeping the kinship ties. And now on top of keeping the kinship ties, it's to your parents. That's threefold. Threefold the goodness. You believe that you're actually having less money? La wallah. You're not. Allah will make it up for you either now or later. So if you believe properly, you won't be sitting there checking your balance before and after. And this is tested, wallah. Yani this is tested in a sense that many people do this with their parents and they get promoted at work while others get fired. They get a bonus from somewhere that they didn't have even calculated into their salary. Somehow, some way the money comes. Subhanallah. And it's, it's from Allah. It's from Allah. It's payback from Allah. So have this proper belief and don't worry about it. Give them, give them, let them. But advise them in a separate occasion, not while you're giving them the money. In a separate occasion, advise them about extravagance. Use the right time as a general reminder that living extravagantly is not something that is praiseworthy in Islam. Don't do it while giving them the money because they're going to say you're just being cheap. You know that much. Done. I, that is a, a record number of questions, mashallah. It can be the last no, I'm, I don't mind. I don't mind. Sometimes the questions are better than the lecture itself. So, <laughs> not sometimes, most times actually. <laughs> Type. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If you miss praying for almost a year or more and you're a Muslim and this person performed Umrah for one day from Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha prayer. Is it helping to pay the best prayer? Yes. But I mean, 
you, again, we don't do this again. There's always that, that area where people want to be funny and they forget that they're dealing with Allah. Allah knows what the chest can see. They say, okay, I can do this on yearly basis technically. I can leave the salah, go perform umrah, pray the five prayers in haram, eat salah as how many times? A hundred thousand? Yeah. So yani, mathematically speaking, I'm good to go. No. Not with Allah. Okay? Not with, if you have that attitude. But if you truly were in that predicament and you repented to Allah, then yes, we believe the Prophet ﷺ. He said the salah will be equal to that many salawat, of course. And that goes into the equation. You can't deny it, but you can't have that as an attitude in life and think you will get far. You will not get far with this. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. Uh, please kindly give, that's nice, please and kindly give a detailed explanation on images in children educated, uh, education books and CDs regarding the hadith that angels do not enter house where a dog or images are as well as join jinn using the images okay, it's a lot for the kids here now, type so sisters, uh, regarding that question uh, the scholars speak about the images that are present within someone's household They divide them into two main categories That which is avoidable and that which is unavoidable What is avoidable is ultimately the pictures that people put of themselves Your graduation picture, a picture of your uncle, a picture of your nephew A picture of a rabbit that you took down the street Whatever that, that stuff that is within your control that is what you have to remove, otherwise you cannot expect the angels to enter your house. Because in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that al-malaika la tadkhul bayt fi surah aw kalb. They don't enter a house which has a picture or a dog. For the dog lovers, yani, who love to have dogs so much, keep that in mind. Um, however, books, educational books, uh, textbooks, medical books, and so on and so forth, those images are part and parcel of the book and in many cases the image is an illustration of something that is a fundamental necessity otherwise you will not understand especially medical books the picture may be showing you how to do a certain procedure and you can't just blot it out and then say well <laughs> you'll be a terrible doctor when you've done why well, not killing half of the patients because well i removed the picture yaki. i was trying to protect the family from the malaika Allah <laughs> Wallah you have to see this thing. You have to understand what you're doing. So the scholars, they, they basically say those are excused. And they fall under the fundamental principle of Islam. The, the fiqh, the principle of الضرورات, to be المحضورات. Necessities allow restrictions. You, you have no choice. You have no choice. So whatever you're able to remove, you remove whatever is fundamental, important, and unavoidable, you keep. Similarly, no, none of you is going to go get a new passport issued and then as soon as you get the passport, oh, Astaghfirullah has a picture of me, bah! flood it out. I want to see you travel somewhere with this passport. And you're not going to be able to get on any airplane. Yeah, so a, you have to have some logic also in, in the things, right? So as long as you have logic, you're good to go, inshallah. Um, if women listen to music either than weddings and Eid, is it haram? Yeah, oh, so only women? Now, if women or men or children listen to music outside of a wedding or uh, Eid, then yes, it is haram. It is haram. And the lecture, the classical hint, it's bad, explains why. There's a hadith in Bukhari, and there's a hadith in Tirmidhi. There are seven total narrations about the, the rulings on musical instruments and professional singing. And focus on the word professional singing. Because the issue is not with singing. A mother can sing, uh, you know, a nursery rhyme to her children. Uh, you know, a woman may sing to her husband. Uh, as Sheikh Asim al-Hakim said, they asked him, is it allowed? He said, he said, it is allowed unless she has a terrible voice because torturing the Muslim is haram. <laughs> that was like probably the best joke I'd ever heard in my life online. That was a classic. Uh, so yeah, uh, basically she can, that's fine. But professional singing is what is not allowed. Why? Because a lot of the so-called nasheed is professional singing. Some dude is on stage with a very fine voice and sound system and sound effects and uh, CDs and albums being made and da da da. Now you're entering a whole other area. But a regular, you know, a regular kind of poetry, all the most of the sahaba recited poetry. 
So if a bunch of brothers are together and they recite some sort of poetry of this sort, there's no issue in that. As long as they don't have, you know, some, some guy among them who is something else where he turns it into a concert, then we're good to go. Otherwise, everybody's in trouble. Now, yeah, then you're excused. The Prophet ﷺ went to the point, he was so keen and protective of himself that he would actually seal his ears. And he had Ibn Umar with him. And he told him there was a man, a uh, uh, shepherd with a flute. He told him, is he done? Is he done? Because he didn't want to hear it. Uh, nowadays, this, and of course, you might be in a situation where you could do this. But if you go to a mall or a, or a restaurant where they play music, you're not going to be able to eat like this. <laughs> Brother, go ahead and eat the burger. La wallah, ya sheikh. Are they done? Ya Habibi, they're not going to finish. Barakallah feek. They're going to have this throughout. Eat your burger so we can get out of here. Otherwise, it's going to be a six-hour mission. So the scholars overlook the situations where music is being imposed on you as long as you don't start yani, grooving. You can't say, Wallah, Wallah, hey, brother, I can't help it, but this is a nice beat. And now you go and they say, time out. Now you're reaching a level of entertainment. So you let it, it's in the background. It's there, but you're not involved in it. It's, you're not involved in it, you're not actively listening. So it's a, there's a difference between hearing music and listening to music. You hear it, you don't listen to it. Now, it used, there used to be days, yani, uh, I don't know how... Uh, here in Jeddah, when we go to a restaurant and they would have music, Wallahi, we used to turn it off 98% of the time. 98% of the time I go for, look for the manager and say, Akhi, Anna, I came here to eat, not to hear this uh, Fifi Abdo. Turn this thing off because, it, and they used to be uh, considerate. Nowadays, if you ask, they say, Afwan, well, where do you think you are? Say, <laughs> I'll go to Abu Zaid, have some food and tamiz, and we're done. Yes? Abu Musa, you see, uh, can, we, can we say that the Akiza, can we say that it's mainly the study of, of, of the knowledge, proper knowledge of Akiza's attributes? Aqeed? Yeah, you could say that. See, Aqeed and Tawheed, because Tawheed is basically the names and Tawheed is learning Allah's lordship, Allah's you know right to be worshipped alone, and Allah's names and attributes. This is, for example, Tawheed. Tawheed is Tawheed is within Aqeedah. So Aqeedah is the biggest umbrella. It's the biggest umbrella, and from that branches the Iman and uh, Tawheed, and the, they are all related in so many ways and everything else falls under aqidah aqidah is what you start with it's the proper understanding of all of the sub elements it's about it's almost like you're you, you have an engine and you want to tune the engine so that you have the maximum performance for your cylinders and your whatever the, for you to get that ultimate performance you need to have aqidah is what fine tunes all of these elements. You can have them, you can have a beautiful Lamborghini and you have the engine all busted and this thing goes from zero to 60 in 20 days. You know, three people have to push it. And because it's heavy, it doesn't get there. And you can have a small car, mashallah, with barely anything, with the proper aqidah, it's like you have fine tune, and you see this thing flying. It's about knowing the proper belief, the proper understanding of all of the elements of Tawheed and Iman and so on and so forth. It's, it's the proper understanding of Tawheed. Now, proper, proper uh, of, of everything, the proper understanding of Tawheed and Fiqh and Ibadah and more, everything is starts with Aqeedah. How can one Muslim Muslima with firm and unshakable Aqeedah prevent sadness from affecting them on daily basis as sadness is part of human nature? No one said that you're not going to be sad. Maybe I gave you the false impression. It, it's inhuman or unhuman, whichever one is more correct, to be not to be sad. The Prophet ﷺ, when his son Ibrahim passed away, he was crying. He was crying. And he said, Verily, the eyes shed tear. The eyes will shed tear. And the heart is saddened. And I am very sad over your departure, O oh Ibrahim. But I only say what is pleasing to Allah. The, the year in which Khadija. And Abu Talib died. What was it called? Hamul Hazan. It was called the year of sadness. 
So we're not saying that having this is gonna make you, uh, you know, sadness proof. You're like, you have this uh, no resistance to sadness. It's about how to manage the sadness. You will feel sad, but you're also composed. You're in that normal state. Things are under control. When you reach a point of hallucinations and, and, and craziness, that means that now this is beyond the acceptable and the norm. Otherwise, you're about to be sad. Someone dies, yani. you're going to walk around and just smile? You're going to be sad, of course. So, you will be sad, even on daily basis. Your children make you sad, your parents make you sad, your spouse makes you sad. But it's about being able to manage the sadness while having the proper belief and not letting it destroy you. It shouldn't be destructive, basically. That's where the issue is. Um, if a person wants to migrate to a non-Muslim country as he doesn't feel safe in his own country, is it allowed? Yes. Um, you would want to try to migrate to a Muslim majority country first, and then when that fails, I guess you go to a non-Muslim country, but sometimes you run away from something into, and you go into something worse. Now, you may be running away from your country which doesn't feel safe and you go to another country where you will not even know safety. Now, you, they will pick you up at the airport. And then, khalas, it's over. Like, the journey is over. So, uh, please, yani, think deeply about the ramifications of this choice. Not, every, not, not all non-Muslim countries are the same. You go to France, you can't wear hijab. Welcome to France. You know, do you really want to go there? I don't think so. Um, yeah, whoever has a question that needs to be dealt uh, with privately, then yes, you may uh, speak to me, inshallah, after the lecture, or we'll find another means of communication. Anyone else? Oh, I guess there are more. I have apartments in Christian areas for rent. Sometimes to occupy one of them. As Muslim, what is the effect in the images of idol inside their rental? Oh. Yeah, well, from my understanding, the scholars say they separate between, the, between these transactions uh, and they look into the things which are be within your control and things which are beyond, you, beyond your control. They, for example, you're in a non-Muslim country, you own an apartment, and... Is going to be rented by non-Muslims who are going to disobey Allah on it all the time. That doesn't involve you. That doesn't involve you. Unless you're able to do something about it. So if they're playing music loud, for example, and you have a say as the owner of the property that this is harming the neighbors or whatever, then you have to enjoy the good forbid the evil. But you can't knock on the door and walk in and them say, Hey, what are you doing? This is my apartment. Say, Habibi, we rented the apartment without privacy. We didn't rent the apartment without the privacy. So you have limitations of what you can do. So whatever images they have within their house, you can't really tell them, you can rent the place, but you cannot put up, put up a picture, because they're going to go. And yeah, they will go. So yeah, you're not really held accountable for what they do within their own four walls. Allahu A'lam. In regards to the unavoidable pictures, do children, picture books, coloring books fall into this category? Yeah, well, honestly, this is where the scholars differ. And the safest, the safer thing is to... Those are avoidable. Because uh, you can have books, coloring books that don't have humans. Mind you, if the image is not that of a soul possessor, meaning it's not a human or an animal, it's no issue. You want to get a tree that looks like a, a person, no issue. You want to have them paint, you know, mountains and the sun and the moon. Those are allowed in Islam. They're allowed to be drawn, they're allowed to be painted, they're allowed to be creative with them. The restriction is regarding humans and animals. And that can be avoided. That can be avoided, so it should be avoided. Wallahu alam. Yes, brother. Uh, how to apply aqidah while dealing with uh, non-Muslims? How to apply aqidah while dealing with non-Muslims? In what sense? In, in every sense, because you know, I mean, uh, in our daily life, we are surrounded by non-Muslims as well, right? So, I mean, how to have a proper understanding? By exemplifying aqidah in your life, your reactions, your dealings are ones that suggest that you believe in Allah. And then 
by learning whatever you need to learn, so you give them da'wah to that, and by not oppressing them. Our biggest problem with the non-Muslims is that we do a terrible job in giving them da'wah. Someone asked me a question a couple of days ago on WhatsApp from the UK about hating the kuffar. Uh, they're having a debate on some forum about hating the disbelievers. Do you hate the actions or do you hate the disbeliever himself? And then if so, how do you incorporate that into coexisting with them? And if you ask so many people, you will get so many wrong answers. Oh, honestly. Um, first of all, the whole idea of hating the action and not hating the person is baseless. If that were the case, then Allah would have placed all the acts of kufr in Jahannam and the people would be in Jannah. The thing that will enter Jahannam is the person. <coughs> and someone can come and curse your parents and you cannot say, well, I hate the fact that you curse them, but I love you so dearly. <laughs> Hello? You got an issue with the person, man. The, the deeds don't perform themselves. The humans perform the deeds. So the issue is with the human being. And therefore, yes, I have hatred. However, this hatred can never and should never translate into violence, into transgression, into terrorism, into acts of craziness in the name of hating someone. This is where a lot of Muslims have a misunderstanding. Oh, we, we hate the kuffar, we hate the kuffar. So they go on and they violate them and they treat them in a way that Islam doesn't allow. That is not what hatred is. Hatred has to do with the state of the heart that doesn't even have to reflect in your behavior. How many people's parents are so mean to them? Some children, wallahi, genuinely hate their parents. True or false? True. But that you are never allowed Islamically to disobey them. And you cannot force yourself to love someone who's treating you so badly. True or false? You can't. So, I, when I deal with a non-Muslim, inside, I hate that person in the sense that they are so careless about Allah. But my behavior is one where I want to save them from that miserable condition they're in. And so I have compassion, I have mercy, I have kindness because I want to bring them on from the darkness to the light. That's the attitude. That's the attitude. So while you hate them, you don't tell them, oh, by the way, you're this. Oh, I hate you, man. <laughs> what is that going to do to you? Or because I hate you, you go and transgress against them and you say that it's allowed to kill them. It's allowed. That's another set of craziness that the Muslims are involved in. It's about moderation. How the Prophet ﷺ displayed himself with the non-Muslims. How he gave him da'wah with excellence, with good character, with good manners. He is the same one who taught us about loving for the sake of Allah and hating for the sake of Allah. And the same thing with the believer. You hate those who are committing sin. You don't hate the sin, you hate the person. But because he's a believer, there's also love. So you don't hate them full-fledged and you don't love them full-fledged. You love and hate according to their obedience and disobedience. That's the fundamental principle of love for the sake of Allah and hate for the sake of Allah. All right. So I guess that's a, that's a wrap.